Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. Take two here on the intro. I think we're uh, ready. We're all set up and ready to go. We got a lot to discuss today, uh, so I'm excited for this episode. How are you doing over there? Yeah, mo- most most notably, we're both recording. Yes, so that is absolutely that is a that's positive. A, that's an important factor right there. But how are you doing this evening? Uh, doing just fine. I mean, honestly, we we we've got a lot to dive into. A lot of a lot of diving to do. So I have three news items uh, that I, I I brought this week, um, and I wanted to to go through a couple of those. Most notably, the first one. Um, yeah. so there is, there is a wired.com uh, story, which is hundreds of ways to get stuff done. And we still don't, uh, the tagline being, you want to be productive software wants to help, but even with a glut of tools claiming to make us all into task masters, we almost never manage our tasks. Uh, so Jack, were you able to to read this article? Did you get? I did. Out of this? I loved it. Uh, I think my favorite part <laughs> of the article was that uh, people call the task complete once they've added in added the task into their productivity tool. I think was the main takeaway, main point that I kind of laughed at, kind of loved. Uh, was that uh, yeah, people think they're done with the task once they add it into their list, into their application, but really, in fact, they haven't done any work except write it down on paper. What did you think of the article? What was your favorite part of it? There were a lot of points to this article there that were. I thought were really, really good. Um, I, I think the first use case was the first application case study that they took a look at uh, where they saw that uh, 41% of to-do items on the application People's, were never actually done. Well, that was the board, uh, or that was the application. I think they had 6,000 users. They were looking at anonymized data. Yeah, they had anonymized data. They had a, a lot of users, and a lot of users would create a lot of tasks and then leave the site or, 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 yeah. or at least never come back. So that was that was very telling that the tasks actually didn't get completed. Now, that may sound, you know, to someone who is a board enthusiast, right? My knee jerk reaction is going to be, well, you, of course not you used to do list, you know, you're using the wrong tool, but right. they dig deeper into there. Right. So there are a lot of different ways. I mean, they point out Trello to do is uh, Gmail's tasks, Microsoft's to do remember the milk things, OmniFocus, Evernote. Yeah. It, there, it just goes on and on. Right. And, and you can do really whatever, but there's, there's something that drives people to use these to-do apps, right? And uh, they're like, what, what, what's, what's going on here? Why do, why do people like to do it, right? And, and really, what's the psychology behind it? Um, and this, uh, the Zygernik uh, phenomenon, right? When a task is unfinished, we can't seem to stop thinking about it. Right. That's that's part of the things we juggle in our mind all the time, you know, and and even I've I'm pretty sure I've said this before. But, you know, if those. Yeah, here it is. Those who regularly write down their to do's seem to possess a mind less jittery. You know, um, even there was a study done where people who created a to do list fell asleep nine minutes faster on average than those who didn't. Right. You I I praise the system I came up with, you know, as, as far as like, like Kanban and, and stuff like that and, and using boards for my everyday to do. It's not really what I came up with, but you know, the, the system that That's I adopted use, and said, right. you know what, I, I created a, a, a to do for myself. Right. And now I'm able to be more in the moment. You've, you've heard me say that before. I'm able to be here. I'm able to be present. I'm able to dedicate myself and focus myself on a, a single task because I don't have that jittery mind what they're talking about. Right. Uh, however, it can often makes things work, right? If so, there are there are a couple problems though. If you don't address it, the to do list just becomes a a wish list, right? Um, so right. the 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 first problem is snowballing, right? Where where you you just keep postponing stuff, and then uh, here it is. 
Uh, and then suddenly you have a hundred tasks that you need to do. And, and that's from the guy who founded Todoist, which is a, a huge to do list application in the, the productivity space. Right. I mean, they have a lot of data to, to work off of. And, and the founder here is, is talking that, that snowballing is a real problem. Yeah. The, the other problem in addition to snowballing is that when we actually offload the problems that we have onto paper or into the system that is, is, is fighting that, that same phenomenon, right? Where we, where we keep reminding ourselves of the things to do in our head, right? We keep that at the forefront, but then our brain almost considers them done because we're not constantly reminding us a thing that is not done. We are constantly reminding ourselves of. So if we externalize that and say, all right, we no longer have to constantly remind it's ourselves of it. Our yeah. brain says, my brain's not, rem- I don't need to remind myself of it. So it must be done. You know, th- therefore it must be done. Th- that's not the case. Right. So we have to actually use the external system to be a substitute for that reminder sequence that we we have ingrained into our heads, right? So the the two problems is that we let it snowball, right? And we let it snowball because at some level we actually consider it done once we've actually Just written out it. and, and yeah. defined the task. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that the author brings up um, about software being opinionated, right, is that it presents a way of getting something done, right? It 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 pre- presents a it postulates, right, that this is a this is a way to actually do things correctly, right? Because because if if, if you didn't create it in the first place, I mean, there you know there there wouldn't have been a a hole or or a need to create it, right? It, but obviously, since you did create it, you did see a need to, to create it. So so what is that purporting to solve, right? And if the majority of it, it, you know it, at least a, a very large percentage of to-do lists don't actually do what it says on the tin, right? What is the opinion of that software, right? Because, you know, for many who who try software, it won't help, right? Maybe it's because the application doesn't match the way the, the, the customer's mind works uh, or the customer's a hot mess or their workload is unreasonable. Uh, either way, like the, the tool that's supposed to solve their problem isn't solving their problem for a large percentage of cases. So, I mean, what's, right. what's the use of that app? Is, is that app actually good? Um, and to answer that, I, I do like that the author actually sat down and worked on his own application yeah. and said, I'm going to, I'm going to try to make a bespoke, you know, perfect for me little, little to do application. And he said it was great. And helping me visualize work, but it wasn't helping me get anything more done. And uh, at some point, it turned into a list of shame. And you know, he he just kind of had to brush everything off to the side. And I was like, man, that's like it, at, at every level, someone who is who's like us, who's a maker, who's a builder, you know, who's who's ready to put things together. We're like, yeah, I could. If I did it, I could do it better, right? So it's incredibly for, humble for him to to share his story here and said, even when I did it, I could not make it better. Well, I think there is a solution, though. I mean, you have to find a system that works for you at the end of the day. I mean, he built his own... It's not, he built, it sounded like he cracked out PHP, wrote his own application. He said, it, you kind of already spoke on it, great for visualizing work, but it didn't help him solve his own problem. So it sounds like he had something more to deal with than you know an app and it doesn't sound like an application was going to sh- the shoe that was going to solve his problem it was something yeah so more. there's there's a there's a couple things so there's definitely the application that is important right and people understand that it's important uh, I, and then and then immediately after they understand it's important they understand that they're missing something but what is that something and i right. think that's actually right. two different things right so the the author said he declared bankruptcy and then pulled a piece of paper out and reprioritized, writing down a small handful of things he could actually accomplish. And that ends up being one of his recommendations is that actually forcing yourself to rewrite stuff on a calendar, whether it's like a month to month kind of thing or a week to week, you know, and, and carrying stuff over that didn't get done. Yeah. Having to rewrite it forces you to reprioritize. Right. 
right? And reconsider to say, is this something we still want to do? Is this something that I'm willing to continue to hold over? Or do I literally just not care about it anymore? So that is one thing to chew on. Uh, another one is uh, to, to think about um, when we're prioritizing tasks for ourselves, we are literally saying that of all the things that I could be doing with the limited time that I have on earth, this is something you know, that I want to make sure that gets done right. before I die. Right. And yes, that is a very extreme way to look at it, but I, I think it's a very good way to start saying, all right, the reason why I'm prioritizing this is because out of all the things I want to have done in my life, I definitely want to have done this one. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and there was a, a whole bit in here about, you know, considering, as I call him, future Andrew, right? And making his life easier, right? That's why I automate things. That's that's why I uh, continue to, to push and, and, and work now so that I can go on to bigger and better things. And, and future Andrew can reap the benefit of that. Of present and Andrew, yeah. If, yeah, exactly. Of, 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 uh, at the expense of, of President Andrew, right? Um, and it's it's a lot easier to kind of throw work into the future and say, ah, I can get that done, you know. Um, it, we, we even talked about it, you know, one of the things, one of the lies that we tell ourselves, the five lies that we tell ourselves about being more productive yeah. is, I will be more productive next time. And it's like, no, you won't. Do something and do it now. Uh, so there are there are a couple different aspects of this. Obviously, the the more metaphysical, uh, philosoph- you know, philosophical one, um, and then also the organizational system of of cycles, right? And and of being able being able to, to come back and and uh, do different analyses, right? Of of tasks at hand uh, because. Whether you like it or not, we're always prioritizing. Right. Right. I'm prioritizing doing this right now over a whole bunch of other totally. things. Totally. Right? Yeah. And, and and so I chose to do that today. I chose not to call this off today because I this is a priority for me, right? If something happened with my family and yeah. I had to go to like to the hospital or something, I would reprioritize this because that is a higher priority, right? So so we're constantly making these these priority decisions. And like we were talking about last week, I mean, one of the big problems is I don't want my system in, in last week we were talking about our, our campaign board system. I don't want it to lie to me. Right. So if I have another priority that comes up, right, I don't want that board to lie to me and say, well, actually, something else is prioritized. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> this is the priority. I have reprioritized. It has changed. The, the priority has changed. And making sure that that's reflected in whatever tool you're using instead of letting it lead you, you have to lead it. And I am all for letting automation take the reins do and that. just do its yeah. thing, right? Yeah. And, and people will think, you know, AI will do this as well. It's like, no, AI is not going to make those priority decisions for you, right? The humans are still going to be making those decisions but it's going to be a lot easier for me to tell an AI, hey, by the way, go ahead and prioritize this family emergency or over me the, over right and it'll know to go into the board and create the thing and to send a message to you and to do all the know, things update yeah. the twitch feed and do all the things exactly right that's the, the what the automation what the ai can can help with right actually making making the philosophical choice to prioritize one thing in your life higher than the other is something that we're always going to have to fight with and that you cannot pass off to someone or something else uh, unfortunately that's just reality you can't you can't always wait for your boss to give you something and you know you you can't just let life hand you things i, I mean i mean you can right and and that's what ends right. up in in different situations where you can just start bemoaning your own scenario and you're like oh i can't believe you know someone put me in this place and I was like, well, you put yourself in this place because you didn't make a decision. You didn't prioritize anything over this. You, you let whatever priority come smashing into your face and let it all kind of come out in the wash and, and whatever, whatever spaghetti stuck to the wall is, is what ended up being prioritized. Yeah. You, you did not make a decision. You did not prioritize. You did not, you know, fulfill the, 
fundamental aspect of humanity, if you want to go that deep, and to do something before you die, right? You just let it happen. And I, I am not willing to let myself get there. So as we, as we pick up these systems, as we see this technology evolve, keep in mind what we're providing, you know, the, the, the systems that we're providing are simply that they're simply systems, right? And that, that's why I believe fundamentally that it's important to have a, a conversation. That's why we offer, you know, when, when sign up for an Arcompose instance, I am more than happy to come in and just sit down for an hour and just say, where are you at? Right. Where you want to go? Totally. You know, how, how do you want to use this? Right. And, and here's how people benefit from using this. And, and here are anti patterns that you don't want to fall into. Right. Because there, there are things, there are always temptations to give up control and just to let the, the thing do what you think it's supposed to do rather than what it's actually supposed to do. Right. Yeah, exactly. And using these tools correctly is, is difficult because knowledge work is difficult because figuring out what to do and prioritizing is difficult, right? And as soon as you realize that if we can sit down and we can have that conversation, you can realize that yes, you're, you still need to prioritize. You still need to groom the backlog. You know, you still have to figure out what you're going to do day to day and, and take on risk and figure out, you know, what, what chances you want to take, right? then you can let the system do the job it's actually suited for and you can be successful. So I, that's that's where I'd love to step in and, and sit down and say, hey, let's get to work working on some of the tools that our Compose provides. Definitely. I love that. I loved it. I think speaking of uh, two people here that didn't let the wind blow them around. Yeah. We have a rework before base camp. I... I have DHH as a founder of Basecamp. He actually wrote Rework. I have the book somewhere around here. Did he? Who did he write it with? I, I can't think of the other guy's name, but I did get to listen. They have a podcast. Got to listen to the episode and kind of what they were doing before Basecamp, um, which I found it sounded like uh, mid-90s, uh, just going around and selling websites. And literally just cold calling, picking up the phone, saying, hey, do you want a website? And people were dumb enough to say just yes. And he said they sold like five that way, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. But no, it kind of talked about how they worked on the the debt model. I don't know if you caught a lot about that. An unsustainable business model. And then. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's mainly what I was was wanting to, to talk on, because the. Uh, the the stories that he told right about what was that quaka the little the Australian bush yeah, animal yeah, yeah, thing yeah. right that that site that he worked on and and a couple others uh, thirty seven signals he was talking about uh, and and he was just for about a period of two years jumping around in the in the startup culture totally right and he had this line I was just listening to it in the grocery store today he had this line he's like I didn't know where the money was coming from. I, I never thought to ask. It, it was just, you know, they gave us our own hotels. You know, they gave us our own anything we Desks, asked for. Yeah. You know, it's just, yeah. It's, it's just like I, I didn't ask where the money came from. It was it was part of that startup culture. It was just there. You know, in, in the, the end, you realize that it's investors, especially when the investors come calling for returns. Hey, right. Uh, but, you know, right. especially in the dot-com bubble and you hear it all, all, you know, now in Silicon Valley, it's like – People are just pouring VC money into these startups, and you know he was also talking about where someone else took out a a loan for a startup, personalized right? loan or personal guarantee loan. Are you talking about mm-hmm. that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. And and talking about still working to pay that off is what it sounded like. Yeah, yeah. yeah like like he's he's probably still paying that off. I mean, it's it's not great, but that that kind of startup mentality where where you're not looking for sustainability in growth or revenue or income or anything like that. You're just looking for just explosion, just this, this huge type of uh, unsustainable growth in, in both 
contracts and personnel and potential he was he was talking about and and it really gripped me when he was like yeah we sat down and and mapped out all the projected revenue as soon as we broke into the european market yeah right we didn't even have a, a line know, of code anything near right. a foot, foot, yeah we didn't have a lot of code we didn't have a product we didn't even have a rep in europe we didn't even know any of the european languages right he's like but but we made up these numbers, pulled them out of thin air, and and then sure we enough, set our him. budget according to that. Yeah. yeah, sure enough, you failed to hit all of those numbers. But you, you're you're sitting there, and and why are you making up this this fantasy, right? We we come back to this. If you don't stare reality in the face, you're gonna end up in a bad situation, right? Debt is just a really easy foothold into fantasy land. Like it doesn't have to go there, which is why you can't say debt is bad because it doesn't have to go into fantasy land. But it is so close. It is the first step in there, right? Because then you can say, all right. But then if I far borrow against the future, you can start making these leaps in logic where where you divorce yourself from reality. And that's always going to be scary. So uh, I, I definitely wanted to highlight that and, and just the way that debt and VC funding and, and that kind of – not helicopter money, but that, that kind of free money, that kind of like money that's just being yeah. thrown around, yeah. right, can really lead to some, some off-the-wall – crazy ideas and just like if if you're in that world right if you are if you're standing there if you are day-to-day in that it doesn't look crazy because everyone else is doing it right, right? take a step back and you're, you, where's the money coming from investors okay do they actually want that money back <laughs> do they need that yes <laughs> it was it was just really apropos especially with what we were talking about uh, vc funding yeah. and and helicopter money and uh, I, I thought it tied in really good with with the kind of ethos that we, we try to create here. Um, so I, I don't know where I'm getting all these good podcasts from, but man, they're just they're just hitting me left and right. So I was going to say it, it sounded like they were picking up rework here in the fall and it sounded like it was going to be series based is my understanding of it. It does sound like they're going through the book again, so this may be a good chance for us to wait for them to do that and then give our own hot take on it afterwards, maybe. We'll see We'll see how that goes. Uh, and then the last intro item here, I did want to touch on uh, some Bitcoin Cash developments. I always try to keep my ear to the ground when it comes to these the, the, the ecosystem here. Uh, so Smart BCH has been in the works for a while. It is, I believe we went over something like this. It is a implementation of something of a, of a virtual machine on the blockchain. It, it extends functionality uh, without really diverting too much. It's, it's not, it's, it's, I believe it's a side chain, um, but that's getting too down into the weeds. I think, what you need to know about this is that all of the dApps that are Ethereum based, so everything that's coming to the Brave browser, all these different IPFS applications that are being launched, um, everything that is uh, being being built upon Ethereum's Turing complete blockchain type type deal, where where you, where you create these distributed applications and and DeFi, you know, dis, uh, decentralized yeah. finance. All of all of that buzz um, is now available on BCH as well with the implementation uh, of this. So that is some really good news, and I'm very excited to see where that goes. So once again, just this is just me keeping an ear to the ground uh, of of what's going on over there. Yep, I don't have anything to say. Uh, you covered it. It was the uh, well, really the blurb at the very bottom of the article. It says about smart. BCH. It's smart. BCH is a sidechain for Bitcoin Cash and has an aim to explore new ideas and unlock possibilities, kind of general. Uh, it has a compa- It's compatible with Ethereum's EVM and Web3 API and provides high, through- high throughput yep. for dApps in a fast, secure, and decentralized manner. Yep. Yep. You know, and, and in the podcast, in the Basecamp Rework podcast, you know, they were talking about they, they feel the same hype. Uh, in the Ethereum uh, and and Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency uh, ecosystem that they did back in the 2000s, and I I 
agree. I mean, there there is a lot coming out. There's a lot of scams. There's a lot of stuff that isn't providing value. There's a lot of stuff that's overvalued. Um, and there's a lot of shady stuff going yeah. on. And there's just there's there's just a lot of things that no one knows a whole lot about. Right. There's there's a very there's very few amount of people that know the ins and outs and, and can see through all of the cons all of the time. So um, whenever setting foot in that, I am I'm always wary. A bit hesitant. Um, yeah. And yeah, I- I- exactly. So I, I just go with the coin that has the longest history to it, which at this point is, is going to be Bitcoin Cash. So. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to my guns with this, and just excited to see more cool stuff being bolted on. Uh, but speaking of keeping the ear to the ecosystem, you are able to dig up some news articles if you want to run two through those. small two smaller items. I would say um, Rundeck 3.4.2 was released uh, pretty recently here. A lot of enterprise updates, which I saw. The one that really stuck out was the way they are now doing. Um, I'm gonna pull it up here. It's the way data is returned. It's now available in like a JSON format. Uh, I think that's on the enterprise format for now. I didn't see if that was released with the community edition. It says release 3.4.2. I assume it's going to come out here for community edition pretty soon. Um, And then there were setting rule sets for the way tasks are essentially run. Love me some JSON. Easy to parse. Easy to parse. And then the uh, other one here is widgets in WordPress and beyond. So just a short little news item about WordPress going full on widget in this, you know, what you see is what you get editor. So uh, again, with this one, nothing too crazy uh, coming out of WordPress here. Uh, there, I think it was last episode we touched on 5.8, uh, which was the new release. And this is just kind of expanding upon that and talking about how you can create widgets that are, I don't want to call them functional, but essentially the big example that they had was being able to set, uh, I think the example is a restaurant and being able to say, all right, you know, Monday through Sunday or Sunday through Saturday, you're able to select the date. And then based on the date, it's able to say, all right, we're closed or we're open for the, uh, these hours or, you know, uh, basically open and closed, nice. just a sh- short little widget. But nothing too crazy with this as well. Just kind of expanding on that 5.8 release. Yep. Two quick updates from the community. Now, our updates, I think we're ready to dive into those. We have a, a lot coming down the pipe here. So what we can we can start with a, not an incident, but something I had to take care of. Uh, as it as it cropped up uh, uh, sure. right at the end of recording the previous episode, uh, we had begun to run up against a space constraint uh, in our uh, organization instance, yep. which isn't a, like we can we can extend space using block storage. Right. So that's absolutely the thing we can do with DigitalOcean. But, you know, I'm lazy. So what I ended up doing is is I wanted to see is there anything that is blatantly taking up more space than it should. Sure. And I went through and saw that Rundeck uh, was taking up like 16 gigabytes Love of it. space to store its execution logs, its Love output it. that we read once, if that, uh, and, and are then done with. Uh, so I went and cleaned up about. 13 gigs worth of that 12 gigs worth of that uh, and also set a run deck execution cleanup parameter so i do have that linked um, and i also put it into the notes itself and uh, as to how to set up the execution cleaner so our in our uh, run deck documentation we have uh, how to set up that to make it so that all of the executions get cleaned every so often um, sure. Yeah. And and retained for a set amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. So it's exactly what you would expect to have. It's just not set up by default. So we just kind of let everything run uh, without cleaning it up. And clean it up later. Some point at 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 this point, we decided we should probably do some maintenance on it. The rest of these are improvements. Uh, the one that I 
took most responsibility for was the commands receivable Docker container. Uh, so that was, yeah. So that is a task that we set out to do uh, so that portal can run Ansible commands against a host, which is in our run map, run, which is in our roadmap, uh, which you can see. We'll we'll talk about that coming up here. But the the Docker container that we set up uh, is a Docker container that contains all of our playbooks, our collection, all of our dependencies, and the environment, uh, and that is able to be built either inside or outside the actual R Compose instance itself, and then used to operate on the R Compose instance. So this is this is this is incredibly cool what we have going on here because this this actually allows us um, as to to start running commands on the uh, on the host on the itself host. And, yeah. and having already having been able to call the the script using the socket that we previously talked about right now what we're doing is we're creating that container we're creating it programmatically and we're able to call it programmatically uh, so that it's something that happens instantaneously rather than having to build a new container every single time. Yeah, right. And then also this is, this is us creating a container and maintaining that on Docker hub uh, as almost like the, the official implementation while also allowing people who either don't want to use that or, or can't for some reason to have that build locally. So we're, we're trying our best here. And, and as we keep as we've done this these past couple quarters we focused more on creating this in in the lens of a home server uh, so that it can run independently of anything any infrastructure that we set up right so this is a step towards not having to have a pre set up uh you know, Ansible controller run deck command and control machine to run commands on the host. Whereas, you know, we would expect a home server just to fix itself. Just work. Right. right. And, and this is the container that is going to enable that. Yeah. And I think the big thing with the container on our end, at least is speed, not having to build a Docker image or Docker container every time and allowing it just to ex execute and run is a lot faster than waiting for all the packages to be added and basically installing an OS pretty quickly uh, and then running one command from it. So, yeah, which is which is what our our first implementation did. Like the the alternate way to do this is to just set it up on the operating system itself, right? But even at that point, you have to ensure that you're running the correct versioning. So you're going to be cloning down directories. Right. You're going to be setting up environments. You're, you're still going to be running this stuff uh, as if you were setting it up from scratch. You know, make sure you have the right Ansible version. So you're going to be installing stuff on the OS. And even in an idempotent way, that's going to take time, right? So what you would want to do is you want to create a type of semi-immutable infrastructure and say, all right, this is... The container that has all the things just change what I'm running when I run it, and that's what you're getting with the with the container. So it's it's front loading some of the work to get the container built and and ready. But once that's there, it's nigh instantaneous. As Jack will tell you when he's testing out the semi semi localized health checks. Yeah. So those uh, in portal. Those are out there. Basically, what's happening now is we are calling that commands receivable socket and service. We're making, we're communicating over the socket, talking to the service, and we're able to run localized health checks on all the instances. It's pretty quick, and it doesn't touch our run deck infrastructure at CE. Uh, we're gonna talk about what is and what isn't run, but basically. With this, you're able to run health checks on. Right now, health checks are running on their own instances. They're they're able to check themselves, and basically, we want to make it towards that goal of being able to self-correct, uh, kind of with that home automation path you were leaning towards. So, really excited to see that. I would call it a proof of concept, honestly. Uh, just being able to get a portal to talk over that socket to the service on the OS on, just on the operating system there but really excited to see what we what we what we what we have in store here uh 
for all those socket commands. We had a really good proof of concept, I think, uh, in running the not running the we had a really good proof of concept in pair programming this yeah. you know overcoming oh one my of gosh. our yeah w- w- yeah yeah i mean we 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 sat down uh what was it what last wednesday a week ago yeah uh, and and you were running into issues where you couldn't call the socket or couldn't get it to return or couldn't you know, write so so yeah it was basically so we we were we were scratching our heads we were reading the documentation we were RTFMing and trying to figure out you know what was going on and and between you know how I had figured out that Python dealt with sockets and and digging into the the code that it was looking for and figuring out what it was expecting versus what Ruby expects and how it writes sockets and how it closes and then listens to sockets and stuff like that and and just us learning a new aspect of the technology that we both know. And so sitting down and, and expanding our, our frame of reference and, and being able to, to have more stuff at our disposal. Right. So, cause not now Jack and I both know, like we have at least a baseline for how sockets work right. in both Ruby and Python. So we're sitting down, you know, with, with that tool under our belts too. So I'm very excited uh, that should make a lot of the work that we're going to be doing going forward a lot easier. It's easier, yeah. And a real quick side note on that: uh, in Ruby, you have to close the data, close the write stream after you're done writing. That was the big. That was our big hang up. That's where we were stuck, but we ended up figuring it out. So, pretty exciting stuff. So that was down the that pipe was here. those pull requests. Those two pull requests are going to be merged shortly uh currently right now they're still on their own branches they're not in master yet uh they will be as soon as we clean up a little bit and that's part of our review process too you know we we both came back with stuff that we wanted to see so we're, we're gonna have more conversations about that uh and then push them through but i think the heavy list lifting for that is done for the most part yeah. uh, and this can actually be seen in our roadmap right so uh, this is going to be pushed out after this episode is released, but uh, our roadmap is released publicly. Like we have a public link to it. And if you really dig down into GitLab, you're going to find where, you know, our, our, our links are. Uh, but the, the, the roadmap, Jack and I worked really hard on figuring out how to make sure once again, that it accurately reflects reality, right? Um, how we deal with our day-to-day tasks uh, and, and how those tasks reflect uh, back up into the roadmap. So anyone coming into the roadmap to see, hey, what is the status on this job? How is this prioritized? You know, how many things are complete versus not complete in this, uh, you know, this, this feature that I want, right? That can all be seen from the roadmap point of view. Now, what we don't expose is our day-to-day board, right? With all of our incidents and bugs and little, yeah. uh, our recordings and, you know, all the inside baseball, right? But what we do expose is, is the roadmap with with all the features that we plan on implementing and when we plan to implement them and the progress that they, they're at currently. So uh, that that was really cool. We we've we structured these last two quarters to be able to do that. And finally, I, th- I think we're at the point where we're both confident that, yes, this does accurately reflect reality and, and we're willing to release this. So. Um, that will be up by the time this releases on our Uh Any any thoughts on that, Jack? While well, I have a sip of water before the next segment. No, no comments. I was uh, a little concerned there when you did expose the uh, regular Q3 board, and I was like, Shush. <laughs> Shush. wait, hang on. But part of the peer review process. So yes. <laughs> nope. Nothing nothing else to add. Uh, check it out. It is in the show notes. But I think with that... We're ready to start talking about the nuts and bolts of this episode. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and really actually indeed dive into the nuts and bolts of Bitwarden because here we're going to be talking about the instance configuration. So this talks... Uh, this, this is about actually setting up uh, the Bitwarden server and, and not merely deploying it, but like once it's deployed... What is available to me? What do I need to tweak? What do I need to be aware of? You know, security settings, uh, personal settings, stuff like that. Uh, and then also checking in on the clients. You know, what what is available to me? What can I do with these clients? First of all, there's a dark mode. So you have to be aware of that. That has to be number one. Of course. One. Glad but, you brought that up. 
beyond that, beyond that, what are we going to do? Right. So uh, taking a look into our uh, instant settings here. So in, in Bookstack, I, I copy literally from Bitwarden's documentation, their official documentation, the, the stuff about their admin portal, right? So um, accessing the admin portal, what is what is what is the admin portal right and and mainly it's for any systems administrator you know and and uh the the r compose administrator is automatically the administrator of bitwarden right um logging into the admin portal right and and how do you do that so uh walking through that um and then once that admin portal is accessed right what do you need to be aware about so um, it's good to be aware that there are a couple settings that we do not set by default and that you wish, might wish to change, right? Uh, and, and there are a lot here, uh, and I just highlighted several that I think are important. Yeah. Um, so in order of appearance, the first one you come across is allowing new signups. So that by default is true, uh, and we leave it true for the time being, right? So this may seem counterintuitive until you realize that we set up the initial user based on this availability. This also lets us easily onboard any additional users onto the instance. Uh, however, it is worth looking into as an option to set when creating the instance. Uh, it does not cause a major attack vector, especially with additional uh, restrictions introduced. Um, also, it enables uh, zero it doesn't enable any data leakage as it simply allows additional accounts to be enabled on the system, right? Um, so this may be, this may set off some alarm bells to, to people, but like anyone can sign up for an account on your instance if this is checked, right? And, and this is how we release it to you. Like, first of all, the, the thing I don't want to have come back uh, to say is, oh, I tried to set up accounts for all of my users and I couldn't do couldn't that. Do it, right? Right. No one could log in. Like the worst thing you want to hear is no one can log in because then there's like 500 other problems that, that could possibly be going wrong. And and simply this one is, is going to be the easiest to solve. So we want to get past that hurdle, uh, the first part. Uh, and then the next thing is actually coming up right next. So that's actually setting attachment limits. So setting attachment limits avoids the really large attack vector from leaving account registrations open, which is to run an instance out of space by uploading very large attachments. So if you remember what I was talking about earlier when we were running out of space because of run deck logs, right? It's not actually that we're running out of space, you know, because we can add any space that's necessary. However, that is at an additional cost, right? So what we want to do is we want to minimize that. Uh, what an attacker could do here is create an account and then just start uploading large, Gibberish. large files, yeah. right? Um, I think we do have something in Nginx that limits that to a certain... Uh, like like uploads to a certain level, it's not just uh, infinite. Uh, so there is that buffer there, but this would be something additionally to set uh, on top of that. Uh, so setting setting that that limit avoids the attack vector of just running out to space. Now we don't set that by default. Uh, that is something that we could look into setting by default, but we just we just don't right now. Uh, there's there's no reason. There's been no call yet. Um, and then every instance, you know, the admin can turn on or off um, the allowing new signups uh, or additionally putting an attachment limit on there as well. Because, um, you know, I don't want Jack to upload a, his photo album to Bitwarden. Yeah, I think it's going to be more li more, more likely uh, one, long fi one long string of uh, characters that's going to be, you know, gigs long. But it's actually just going to be a Ruby key. <laughs> yeah, but it's not going to be a file though. So no, this is a I guess you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> a, f a file, a file ends in a new line. It's just a string. A <laughs> so and 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 I promise this is building something too. So this isn't this isn't necessarily random. So we're talking about uh, attachment sign or attachment limits, and then allowing new signups. Uh, additionally, the next section is SMTP email settings. So like most of the services offered, uh, because there is no currently bundled SMTP service, this is left blank. Uh, however, this can be connected to any email service that you may have set up. So there are many things in Bitwarden that can use an email. So like notifications or two-factor 
or reminders or yada yada. So there's a lot of things that can use email and this would have to be filled out to provide that. We don't provide that yet, um, but there it's there for you if you want to connect it to your Gmail, to your Yahoo, to whatever, and then you can send emails out from there. Uh, and then, then here we get to the part which ties those three things together is that email signup limitations, right? So implementing the above SMTP settings uh, limits, it, it, well, you're able then to implement a signup limitation, right? Uh, so you can verify, require email verification on signups, right? So that is by default false because by default there's no email server, right? So if you turn that on, if you connect an email server and then turn on account verification via email, right? Then you you obviously have to every new account has to be, have a verified email. So that'll that'll block you know neighborhood hacker man who doesn't know about you know uh, the uh, the temporary email services. Um, so you have the temporary email services that you can use to get around that, but, but then, uh, at the very bottom, you do have an email domain whitelist sure. that's optional, right? Now this is, this is particularly interesting if you have an organization whose email addresses are at yourcompany.com, yeah. right? Then your email to limit, your, your, then you're able to limit your signups to emails that are verified that go to your company.com addresses, right? And voila, you have a, you know, you're, you're still able to allow open signups, but not everyone is able to sign up. So there's, there's a couple of ways to work around that problem. Um, and, and I did want administrators to be aware of that um, so that they can adjust accordingly. Right. I, I, I think the best solution and the solution that we're, we're working towards is to implement some type of a SMTP server or relay in there, right? I, I think that's certainly doable for CE infrastructure. Uh, when it comes to self-hosted infrastructure, I'm not sure, but you know, we can we'll we'll Look tackle those it. issues as we as Explore as we it, get yeah. there, yeah. But for the time being, you know, anyone with a Bitwarden instance can add an email server and have that whole preventative measure thing going on. So that's that's pretty cool. Uh, I actually looked at the rest of the settings in the admin portal. There's there's not a whole lot really to add. I mean, we're we're talking about it. It's really just storing encrypted blobs in a database. There's there's not a whole lot you can do. Now, there are things about users and organizations which Jack is going to cover next week, I think, because those are the things that are still blank yep. in Bitwarden's documentation. Um, and if not that, other things, but we will get around to it eventually. Uh, those are really the only other things to be aware about in in uh, the instance settings. Um, however, th- when it comes to client settings, there are a lot more options, right? So, Jack, I mean, you use Bitwarden every day, frequently, yeah, every day, yeah, obviously, every day. What have are to. you know what? What have you, I mean, when's the last time you really set up a client though? Like when's, when's the last time you, you added something new? I have a Vaulty on a different workstation and I set it up for that. And honestly, it ended up just being, I just leave my, I, shame on me. I left, I ended up leaving, I set it up and I left my settings default. I, I think part of that was because Wait, I was right. adding. No, no dark mode? I, Did no, you not even? Nope. No, no, oh, no. no. I, uh configured all my add-ons and bitwarden was one of them i got signed in immediately and it was fine uh you know what though the now that i now that i say i didn't configure anything i do configure the timeout i don't like how it logs me out after like it's too short for me so i end up upping it to i think it's like four hours or something um, so that's perfect because that is the first setting I have here uh, in the documentation is the vault locking. Now that is common to all clients, uh, which is the, the the vault timeout. So the vault timeout is where you choose uh, when your vault will timeout and perform the selected action. And that is then obviously paired with the timeout action. So what do you actually want it to do? Uh, and there's two things. There's lock and log out. So per yeah. their little help text here, right? Locking is a lock vault requires that you re-enter your master password to access it again. And then logged out is a logged out vault requires that you re-authenticate to access it again, right? Man, I think I think I'm going to have to use so that the, logged out instead of lock. I mean, if if you want, I, I would not prefer that. Really? I just okay. lock it. I just lock it, yeah. 
So it it does basically the same thing. Yeah, I know one requires a password and one requires a username and or email and password. Yeah, exactly. Um, and 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 logging out means that uh, nothing will get synced uh, if there is new stuff pushed. You know, it, it's it's everything is there like you were logged in, except a user can't actually access anything. So I I always lock everything. It's it's easier for me, and, and why it's easier for easier for me, right? It's easier to unlock. Yeah. So if you we actually jump down. Uh, to the specifically browser add-on and mobile client section. Uh, the second setting I have there is unlock with biometrics slash pin code. Oh, nice. Yeah. So this yeah. allows you to log in with a pin or biometrics, so like a fingerprint reader uh, on your phone. This is much more convenient after setting up a device than having to retype your master password over and over again. Totally. Right? So a, a browser uh, add-on or your phone, right? You can lock it with your, your phone's pin and just unlock it with your, you know, yeah, whatever. You can do fingerprint reader or you can set up a pin for your browser add-on so that when you go into your browser add-on, you don't have to type your, your whole master password, password again. Because yeah. you, you've already proven that you know you're your logged master in. password right. right you just go in and, and put in your pin now i choose a master password because I, I it's just muscle memory at this point so i'm not even concerned with that that's kind of how, how i am i feel like a pin is just one more thing now biometrics you know what you are is right there so might have might have to explore that one that is a game changer on mobile i'll tell you that it makes it so easy it makes it so easy to autofill on mobile um now, something about the vault locking, uh, the settings are different for the browser add-on, like I said, which allows for timeout to be screen lock and or, uh, so so it allows for the timeout to be different as well. Uh, so it allows for it to be a screen lock and or a computer restart, right? So you can also have those triggers in addition to the purely time-based system. Um, and then as well, the mobile app, you can uh, have it, timeout at an app restart so if you kill the app and restart it it'll force you to uh to unlock as well uh, so there's there's a couple other things when it comes to that uh versus the web client which is just plain time-based yeah yeah so there's there's different ways to to do that the other main setting uh, that is common to all of the devices that I think is important is changing the master password. Uh, so, sure. so first of all, this is important Absolutely. to know that you can do this, right? In in the event that you feel the need to do this, absolutely you can. Right? We're, we're not locking you into the same to, password to, forever. Right. But, but it does interrupt things a lot especially if you have multiple devices right because you're going to have to uh, sign out and sign back in with the new pa master password right you're not going to get synced uh, stuff right so uh, the, the the warning on the web vault here says that active sessions on other devices may continue to remain active for up to one hour and that's due to the way it it syncs right because once you change the master password all the blob addressing changes Right, so what is being requested by the other vault clients is invalid at that point because your master password has changed. So they need the new updated info. So you're going to have to go to your browser. You're going to have to go to your mobile. Right, any other device is going to have to have your new master password, not simply unlocked like we were talking about. They're going to have to have it resynced with the new master password. Uh, so there, there are options in the other clients to trigger. Uh, master password change but they do simply direct you to the web vault so you're going to be doing it on the web vault anyways uh, but just there is the option in there if if you don't understand what change the master password is it'll bump you to the web vault and it'll say okay here's the little warning sign in here's yeah. how you do it and 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 it'll walk you through that okay so i see a little checkbox there to rotate your encryption key have you done that one before? Do you recommend that? I didn't even look at the little pop up there. Uh, I, I I couldn't tell you what that is. It 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 definitely has to do with how Bitwarden's encryption works. They have um, a security section under their help uh, location on their website where it goes over all of the encryption stuff. So I know I did a terrible job. It was like two episodes ago going over that. Uh, they do a much better job. 
describing how all that encryption works and uh, what crypto libraries they're using, how they're using it, um, what AES CBC is, and and, and just going over all that. So uh, I'm sure that'd be in there. I just didn't feel the need to dive into that right now. I mean, it's a check. You can check the checkbox and hope the clients do the right thing. I mean, this this is a pretty. I've never I've never run into issues with Bitwarden. It's always been rock stable for me. I am in the same boat. Knock on wood. Last thing we need. Yeah. Maintain yeah. backups, right? Well, maintain and maintain backups. And like I said, well, yeah, of course there's backups. But like I said, there's the, the the cool thing is that all the clients, if the server gets disconnected, can still run on, offline, right? It's just they're not going to get any synced updates, and nothing's going to change for them. So, um. It's it's a fairly robust system, you know, even even in, you know, like an EMP type situation, right? When everything comes back online and all the servers are gone, I'm still going to hey, be able to log into the websites my, yeah. that aren't up anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to be able to open my my Bitcoin wallet that has no more connectivity to the blockchain. Yeah. So. Very useful. Yay. <laughs> uh, all right. What do we got here? What do we got here? Um. So that is all of the common settings for, for all the clients. Um, there is one specifically for the web app that I wanted to point out, just a little quality of life improvement, uh, which is enable full width layout. Uh, so it actually, when you're logging in and, and doing stuff on Bitwarden, it takes up the rest of the screen and not just, you know, a portion of it. And uh, one of one of my big quirks is, is that I love when stuff does that and hate when stuff doesn't do that. Uh, I, I, I think I spent, let's just call it way too long, um, on my, my own personal blog, Jekyll blog thing, trying to make that the case so that it was responsive, that it would, that would grow and, and, and shrink based on the, the size of, of the, uh, of the, the viewport there, because I was like, this text is taking up like one third of the screen. What, why is it even, <laughs> yeah, why right, do I even right. care about this screen? You know? expand thyself so yeah this is this is something that does that for you for you um and then we have the uh, the browser add-on and uh, mobile client specific settings uh and and really the first thing and and i keep forgetting about this except when i go to set up a client uh, is that you actually have to go and set up the server url that you want it to hit before logging in, otherwise you, Where are you logging you're logging in by to? default logging in Is to bitwarden.com. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, now they do provide you uh, different URLs, and and you have many different URLs that you can set if you want to. But real, really, the only one that you have to set is going to be the 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 top server URL for a self-hosted environment, and that all that contains everything. You know, the Vault Warren has has the compatibility for everything under that domain. And actually, so there is a PR coming where Vault Warren changed uh, their uh, environment variables and added a domain setting, and I can just pass that, that in slash Bitwarden string, and everything works past that. Um, so it's been super nice because there's a there was uh, for a time. The API server was actually under slash API instead of slash Bitwarden slash API, uh, and it perpetually made calls out and back into that slash API, uh, and so this actually fixes that. So I'm I'm over the moon with that. That's that's been really really good to see. Right, fixes a lot of other problems too. There was also a problem with the admin page that that fixes too as well. So it should be smooth sailing from here, he said confidently. All right, let's see. Unlock with biometrics. We already went over that dark theme. Obviously, the only sane choice. There are there are two other big ones here. Um, so there's autofill and sync. So for autofill, I've been I've been wondering what's what's your experience with with autofill. I let it go base domain. So okay. uh, I'll tell you what the one annoying thing has been when I spin up instances or actually just our organization instance for. Uh, compositional enterprises it's annoying because i have we have all those services at uh you know compositional enterprises dot r compose dot com slash whatever slash service name uh that was a little bit annoying uh only because i think i had so many test instances up and i was logging into so much stuff that now it was trying to autofill bad passwords 
essentially. So I had to go in and delete them from the vault. Um, and also a little bit of browser. It was partially my browser's, browser's fault. Um, but Bitwarden, every time I logged in, would be like, hey, do you want to save this password? It's like, no, you've been here before. We have it in the vault here. Why aren't you recognizing this? Yeah, and actually I have a note on that. So so I say that if you don't have the URI saved for a site but are using Bitwarden anyways, it will prompt you to add it to a new entry instead of the existing one. So I will admit I do have uh, – there are some services – I think it's specifically GitLab, GitHub, a lot of developer-related stuff where I log in with – I auto it auto I auto fill with Bitwarden, and then I log in, and uh, that ends up being fine. But if I log in just using, you know, username, password, and, you know, one-time token, it's like, hey, do you want to register this in your vault? I'm like, wait, no, I already have this in my vault. So I've run into it a few times. It's really not – it doesn't kill me, but – it is one of those things that can be annoying. It can I, I I could definitely see it bugging people. And one of the settings here, if it does bug you, is is to disable that ad login notification. All right. So the the notification automatically prompts you to save new logins to your vault whenever you log into them for the first time. And if you don't want exactly that behavior that you're talking about, right, that it's would be, be the box to check. Yep. That, that would be the action to take to prevent that annoyance from occurring. Um, uh, and, and there are a couple other settings here. So like you talked about, you know, you're matching the base domain. It goes all the way up the chain. You can, if you really want to tweak it, you can have it doing regex matches or uh, matching all subdomains or, or, or uh, adding on uh, pathing. So there's, there's plenty of different ways to to tweak that depending on how nitty gritty you want to get. Um, and then also uh, by default, the clipboard is never cleared, I believe. Right. So when you copy a password, it is in your clipboard forever. Um, but that can be, that can be set as well. You can set a clear after 30 seconds, clear after 15 seconds, yada, yada, yada. Uh, luckily with the browser add on, I'm usually just letting it autofill it for me. Yeah. I'm not manually yep. copy the password. Yep. I'm just clicking, yes, I want you to log in with this username password combo and it autofills it for me in there and then I'm able to log in. Now, do you know if there's a clear clipboard after paste? Because I know some, I was trying to think of, I, I think it's actually uh, KeePass too, KeePass XC, yeah. that had that feature available, which I did like, but sometimes it caused pain for me, I'll just say, but... Um, I didn't know if Bitwarden had that same feature available. No, nah, it's it's all time based. Time based. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's at least there. I mean, that's that's another security feature. One of those little things that you know you wouldn't think about until you start start walking through the process. You're like, oh yeah, by the way, I don't want that hanging out in my you know paste buffer for forever. So that's a that's a good dive out on a limb, but it is an attack vector. Oh yeah, it's oh, totally yeah. an attack vector. I think you, if you go to some sites, they can. Now, I don't want to speak out, but I think if you go to some sites, they can end up reading. Well, the problem is some sites can read autofill because your password's already in there. They, oh, you know, all they have to have is some JavaScript running. Yes. Now, clipboard, yes. I don't think is as much a threat as that autofill, but wanted to bring up both of those. And that is something to be aware of too. However, because Bitwarden does have the ability to autofill like the, we're 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 talking about uh the or uh, um i guess i guess autofill so what do i want to call this now what autofill site you haven't been to so it it uh does it without any kind of prompt right so i can i can select the one i want it to fill it with right but bitwarden does have the ability to if it detects a matching site to literally log in with the username and password and that's what you're talking about because that's a very common attack vector with like Firefox and Chrome and other browsers that save your password is that you'll hide JavaScript or text fields or whatever. And then the password autofill service will automatically fill it there. And maybe it's imitating an iframe for, you know, city.com or key.com or your bank.com or whatever. And um, it'll fill it with those details instead of the site that you're logging in with. So, uh, and that can be hidden off, off the page somewhere you know, CSS negative 500,000, you know, whatever it's, it's, it's somewhere not visible to you. Yeah. But, but that would still be legitimate from the software's point of view. So, 
Um, I never turn that on. Um, just because of that, I, I don't find it eminently usable. Plus the fact that, like you said, you know, I log in to some sites and I might have three or four passwords for that right. too. So I never wanted to auto log me into anything in, but I do want to have that fill uh, available to me. Uh, and that fill that's available to me, if it gets updated, will be synced over all of the devices, right? Which is obviously a benefit uh, over something like like KeyPass, where it's going to be static on one device until you right. sync the backing file all around or, or whatever kind, kind of, of a p- setup that pain. you you manage, right? But the the sync uh, in in the clients, obviously, there's not going to be sync of the web client because the web client is a direct interface of the back end. But uh, the sync functionality in the clients is able to be manually kicked off. Um, and that is just in the settings of, of both the uh, mobile as well as the uh, browser add-on. And this is something I don't know. There was actually a, a improvement made a couple of years ago called Live Sync where they're using WebSockets and different push notifications to sync uh, information client to client. Now, I kind of figured that, you know, the the syncing is, is very good in Bitwarden. You know, I, I, I noticed that. I was like, I, wow, they, they really did well here. And this uh, this blog post uh, for, for live sync on Bitwarden.com site really goes into how they how they implemented that and it's it's really cool like and and i'm really excited to see just how well they they implemented that it's just it's it it works exactly as it should i mean that's the thing i don't have to think about it it just just does it so i'm 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 very happy when when software does its job and does it well so um i did not have anything about the desktop client or the cli because uh, I frankly don't use those, uh, so if you do, yeah. feel free to jump in. But no, I actually don't have the uh, Bitwarden desktop instance installed on my desktop. I go web, I go plain web UI, I go the add-on. I would say add-on is number one use. Uh, the web UI yeah. I use two, and then. Like three is mobile, and then I'm sure at one point in time here I'll start to dive into the CLI just for it seems like a great way to manage secrets. Um, but des- I do yeah. not have the de- I do not have that desktop version out there. Uh, actually, the only desktop version I have out there in terms of application is Nextcloud. Just kind of a little shout out there to Nextcloud. I do have that Nextcloud for Nextcloud Sync and then Nextcloud Ditto. Mobile. Yeah. yeah, but in terms yeah, of Bitwarden. Yeah. No, I'm kind of in the same boat as you. Add on and then web UI, and that just kind of rounds out my my use cases for that that tool, right? And it 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 does its job and and does its job well. Now, something that isn't necessarily relying on tools, but more so processes, is the agile methodology Scrum, and and this is something that I, one of the first actual agile methodologies to be codified, really. Um, and and Jack, you actually did read the the Scrum book. You, yeah. you did what I oh, could I, not. I loved it. I, I don't know how you couldn't do it. The book was so well written. I was waiting for just one big prescription from this guy, um, but it ended up being a lot of an- anecdotal stories. And I think along with the stories, we got the implement. We got a little bit of the implementation. Now, qu- real quick here, I want to clarify. So. I have Agile as the methodology and then Scrum as the way to implement it. Is that sure? how yeah. you want to call yeah, it? I'll go with how that. you want to call it? Okay. I'll go with that. Okay. Um, all right. So jumping into this book, I love it. They go with, they go immediately to the government doing a, a terrible job at their job, uh, just blowing taxpayer money. But I, I, you know, I think this is where I got hooked. Great hook in the story. Um, FBI spent... I have to get the number. I didn't have it right in front of me. I, it was an absurd amount of money. I think it was $130 million on this initial project uh, to modernize information sharing. Uh, after three years and millions of dollars, they didn't bother looking at any of the processes. Essentially, what they did is they went the waterfall method, which was, I don't have the seven steps in front of me right now, but it's like plan, you know, basically plan it all the way out from beginning to end, build out your 
Gantt charts all the way from day one to day finish, you know, three years in advance. And then from there, you're basically saying, all right, let's just, after you have this entire plan, thousands of pages in notes and planning and, you know, budgeting and all this, essentially you go down and you implement it. So it's this one, there's no feedback cycle. It's basically plan it and then we're going to do it. it's like, oh, okay. All right. Uh, Sure enough, I think it was three years in, they're running into issues. All right. Think about that. They're running into issues three years in. They do the next best thing. They hire a contractor <laughs> to do it to, oh boy. for the implementation now, I, I, which I think is hilarious. So they hired one contractor. The first group couldn't do it. They, instead of bringing it in-house or saying what's going on, they decide to go to a second contractor. And guess what? Same exact thing happened. You know, they hand out all these 1,000-page summaries. This is the plan. This is what we're going to do. Sure enough, doesn't get implemented. This information sharing program that in the book he quotes as could have stopped 9-11. So pretty big event that could have been stopped or prevented. But Scrum, uh, so what ended up happening is after two contractors in, and I think it was you know a couple hundred million dollars, they said, okay, let's bring this in-house and look at this from our own perspective. Let's see what we can do. Where Where is this breaking down? Why is this breaking down? And it ended up being, if you were to ask me one thing, it's that feedback cycle. So they brought it in-house and talked about implementing Scrum, essentially. Uh, so Scrum reduces the feedback cycle and it forces that continuous inspection and adaption cycle for forcing the question why at every task, verifying the need and how it can be improved. And that's what they weren't doing before. They were just looking at a thousand page paper and going, all right, let's implement it rather than asking at every step, why is this needed? Do we need to do this task? So, well, I remember I was, I was mowing the lawn listening to this and uh, I was, I was right at the, the one tree where I had to go around it and, and it's, it's just a real pain. Yeah. Right. But I remember he was talking about specifically as I was cycling around this tree, he was talking about him confronting the people who were implementing this, like all the managers and stuff like this. And he, he lays down the thousand pages on their desk and he's like, all right, who's followed this, right? No one, no one raised their hand. And he's like, all right, who actually read this? And nobody raised their hands, right? Right. It's like, how can you follow this if you don't even know what it is, right? Once again, you're divorcing your reality from what you want the, the, the reality to be. You're 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 trading on fantasy, right? You're you're, you're like this is I I believe in my heart of hearts, right? That this is what we're doing today. It's like, well, no, we're we're not, <laughs> we're not even close to that. So Scrum basically, I I kind of boil it down. Scrum base asks kind of three questions: How can we work better? What were the impediments that need to be removed, and what's slowing us down? Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Really, I love that government example. I thought it was unfortunately hilarious. I mean, how can you not look at it? And instead of even bringing it in-house, they decide to go to a second contractor. Hilarious. From there, it kind of dives into... Really, I didn't break this down by chapter. Uh, I broke it down to kind of bigger points. Uh, so the next big point here is that lessons at great lessons from great companies. And this is when he kind of talked about his experiences consulting and in the military and... Uh, Just kind of what makes great teams and what, you know, lessons he took away from great companies. He said they have multifunctional teams with varied skills and experiences with the autonomy to manage themselves. Uh, Leaders are flex leaders are focused on removing impediments to facilitate facilitate progress. There's flexible and (laughs) flexible and fast development of projects and stages that increment. Uh, There's clear objective and purpose for every member of the organization. I think all of these uh going without saying are just you know they seem obvious but it's nice to know what they actually are um really he kind of harped on clear objective and purpose because when everyone has that same purpose everyone's able to move towards that goal uh some of the other ones uh were you know removing impediments but it was really getting everyone on the same page and then moving towards where you want to go uh, and then he has this nice little quote here that's a, a team has to demand greatness from itself. So 
He got a lot into. He actually brushed on it kind of later in the book, uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose for being kind of what makes a team great, uh, which I know we've talked about before, but just loved hearing that. Uh, So kind of getting into Scrum itself, really it's based on one task at a time. Yeah, I, I think it goes without saying you can't do two things at once. Humans are known. It's proven that we don't multi we don't multitask well. We can only do one thing one thing at a time well. We we can we can switch task, we can background task, but actual multitasking is not a not thing. gonna happen. The other thing I love from this section, and I think it just makes so much sense, is that something that's half done isn't done. And he really talks about this all or nothing kind of situation or all or nothing kind of task. It's you can't mow the lawn fifty percent. You're going to have half the grass looking. Now, okay, you could take that one and go, I have the front yard done, I have the backyard done, it's split up. But essentially, you know, I'm thinking you're cutting half the front yard. That's not done. You're you're not done with that task. It, you've got half the grass looking, you know, overgrown, and you have half of it cut. It just is, the task is not done. So Now, if, you're, if your story is, I, as, as a... Oh, how, how, how did the template go? Um, as a homeowner, I want the front grass cut, right? To, to complete that, that story, you can cut the front front grass, all right? And that's a, that's a completed task, sure, right? Sure, sure. That's, that's not the same as, as a homeowner, I want the grass cut, and then cutting only the front half of the grass. That's a 50% job done, and that's no job done. The other thing he kind of harps on is doing it right the first time. Uh, when you make a mistake, fix it right away. Uh, that, uh, If you ask me, that kind of eliminates that technical debt that we always bring up. If we do it, if it's done right the first time, you don't have to go back and you're not accruing that debt if it's done correctly. Now, obviously there's some caveats with uh, saying that, but in a nutshell, it does, it is pretty sound advice. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hop to the the second part of this uh, because I, I I think that makes it very clear what they mean because do it right the first time. All right, all right, if if you can't do it right the first time, or or if you do it and you think it's right the first time, it's actually wrong. As soon as you find out that it's wrong, right? Could be months down the yeah. road, right? Could yep. be could be way down the road, right? Stop everything and address it because and this is the amazing statistic. Fixing it later can take you more than 20 times longer than if you fix it now. Totally. Because it just adds. It adds on itself. It absolutely just compounds. Uh, well, yeah. Love that. But uh, only kind of getting more scrum here is only playing what you need to. Don't try and pro- uh, project everything out in years in advance. This is kind of going back to that government example. You know, you don't know what's going to happen in a year from now with the plan. You know, you don't know what problems are going to come up. You don't know what's going to take more time than it should. So he kind of puts in here, just plan enough to keep your team busy, which I think is a good idea. Now, I don't know. He didn't really talk about implementation for this. I mean, that could be week by week. He kind of brings up sprints, uh, which I'll talk on, but it seems like you need to have in, in order to stay busy, you need to have some kind of clear overarching goal or purpose that you're obviously working towards. And then you're going to have the stuff that keeps you busy, but you're going to want to be moving towards that goal. And I kind of talk on priorities a little bit later, but it's, you know, what's big impact, what's important to the customer, what's going to make you money and what's and you easiest know what, to, to implement. What, what makes agile agile, right? Why, why the term agile? Because if you think about agile, you think about like quick. Right? I mean, like someone that... going through an optical obstacle course, sure. right? Sure. So someone someone avoiding things that are popping up in their path by changing their direction, right? They're able to, in an agile manner, move around the obstacle, right? They're able to react to a situation, and so the thought here that I think that they're trying to get across is if you try to project everything off, you're not going to be able to see all the obstacles coming your way, right? Just just plan enough to keep your team busy. But I do agree with you. You're going to have to have a goal. Now, if the goal is to get to the other end of the obstacle course, then what you can do is you can reassess each step of the way. How you approach right. every, yeah, every, obstacle. every, every segment. Yeah. Now, and, and maybe like <laughs> to dive really deep into this analogy, 
if we consider it it almost like a, a, a video game as you're going level by level, right? And if you're building out a character, right, there may be levels where you want to be gun heavy or, you know, Right. Maybe you want to be melee melee heavy, or maybe you want to be like spell or wizardry or science heavy or, or whatever kind of game you're playing, right? But but you're gonna to want to take different approaches for, for different levels, right? Uh and something that worked at a previous level, right, or something that you thought you would have needed, you no longer need, right? So in order to be agile, you have to be able to make the decision to reprioritize. You have to say, actually, we no longer need that. Right. We need to be busy, but we can't be busy with something that doesn't give us any value. And you have to scrap that and move on to the thing that does get you value. Right. I, I did kind of talk on those priorities. I'll just briefly mention them again here going out of order. But it's, you know, what's going to have the most impact? What's important to the customer? What's going to make money and what's the easiest to implement? I'll just go right in here to all the priorities. He said aim for revenue first. And I love this. Figure out 20 percent of input that yields 80% of the output. He said, figure out what 20% a customer is going to want, sell it, and then figure out the other 80% later, which it sounds kind of crazy, but I guess it works. Yeah. And, and so I'm going to spoiler alert. I'm going to bring in a video next episode, but one of, one of the things is that the, I mean, you're, you're spot on the small thing that you use every day is going to be more important to you than the one thing you use almost never right and uh as as the guy they, they were doing this like youtube video where you you draw the drawing as you're explaining it right as he was talking about that that 80 percent that nets you nothing because it's essentially useless or useless only a small bunch of people he started drawing like clippy like the from from microsoft word right yeah the one thing that microsoft never needed to include but yeah, I mean, it, absolutely. It's it's going to be those it's, things, the core of the product, it's, you know, and, and, and figuring out what that is is not difficult or not easy. But once you do, you better focus all your resources there. Yeah. So he talks about thinking most value for least effort. Kind of that's a little bit out of order, but then it jumps back here and he kind of describes the actual implementation via, you know, communication and roles, which I'm just going to briefly mm, touch mm-hmm. on, briefly touch on here. With communication, it's keyword transparency. Everybody knows everything. He said communication saturation accelerates work. The next thing here is one meeting a day, and I love this. He said he makes his team stand up, actually stand up for 15 minutes. He said once a day is enough. Basically, get together, see what can be done to increase speed, and then go out and do it, which... Love the little antidote that he he called it stand up because he actually made him stand up. But part of that is part of that team is going to be the role, the different roles on the teams. And so, in this book, he just describes three roles: the development team, the scrum master, and the product owner. And I like how he split up scrum master and product owner. Although I do think scrum master could be someone or something that just kind of comes in and is a helpful implementation. For, you know, maybe get you off the ground, give you like six, you know, a couple weeks with you, a couple weeks, help you get off the ground. Then the product owner can kind of take that role once the entire team is familiar with it. And I don't know, I kind of see us venturing into that. I think it's something that could occur for six weeks. It's an in, in, you know, teach the team. This is how it works. This is how it goes. And then kind of handing off that role to the product owner to kind of do, I don't want to say double, but essentially both functions. Because I think it's definitely something that's possible. Essentially, the Scrum Master is someone familiar with the structure, acting as an advisor and facilitator, with the goal to help the team identify and deal with impediments that arise. I think a product owner could, could do that once trained. Development team, they recommend, I love this, it's a, a diverse skill set and range of people they said three to nine with the ideal being seven i think is what they said yes so anything after nine is too many too much communication too too hard to send communication across the chain to that many people just hard to onboard people uh to the team yeah the the 
the channels of communication expand exponentially, uh, logarithmically, actually, I think. Logarith- exp- whatever, one of those two. When you add an increasing pace as you add new people, right? So, like, the amount of communication channels you have from two people to four people is a lot larger, um, or, well, a lot smaller than the increase when you get from four to six, right? When you increase from four to six, you increase a lot more communication channels. And that's just too many for a small, uh, th- that then a small team should be asked to manage. So, yeah, that's, that, that is very interesting that, that they want you to cap it at seven. I would say with that, that's, those are the notes I included. I didn't know if you wanted to touch on anything else. I didn't really talk about the prescription per se of Scrum with the, uh, I talked about daily standards, but I didn't talk about sprints, which are the planning meetings, or I think there were a couple other, I I think they're called rituals uh, included. I didn't know if you wanted to touch on those. Yeah, so Scrum is actually highly prescriptive, to, despite the book, like, really sneaking it in, like, really under the, the radar there. Uh, but there there is a lot, and a lot of what a Scrum failure looks like is failure to adhere to those rituals um, uh, and and those rules and everything else that, that needs to get done. Um, so to, to back up, uh, we didn't really touch on what feedback loops look like. So did you want to kind of go over in Scrum what those feedback loops look like? Because I, I agree, as you pointed out earlier, they're important. But what would you say they'll look like? I would say they're quick. So obviously you sit down, and I did mention the role of the product owner, but essentially the role is to con- stay in contact with stakeholders, receiving opinions, and feedback from customers basically relaying the vision and the decisions. Basically, you're going to sit down with your team and you're going to decide what's important and you're going to do it for a period of time. You're going to, you're going to list out tasks. And I think they kind of include, uh, I forget what it's called. Poker is the one you basically put all your tasks out there. You bid on them and you say, all right, what's going to deliver the most value for us at this point in time. And then you set out to do those tasks. Now you're not in the waterfall method. You're planning literally project beginning to project. And this is more or less just, kind of like he says, making sure the team's busy. What are people going to pick up and do that is going to keep them busy for, you know, a two, let's say two week period of time. You're going to sit down and say, all right, this is what's important. This is what's going to deliver value. Then after you've done those, you're going to go back and you're going to go essentially to the product owner, as I understand it, have him review with customers to get that actual feedback on the implementation for the product that occurred. That's kind of how I understand it. Don't know if you have any thoughts, any different thoughts, or for that feedback cycle. I think I think you're missing one there. Um, so the the one that you didn't point out was the the feedback of continuous inspection and adaptation of the process itself. So taking a look at where did we get held up. You know, why didn't we complete a thing? Um, what can what can we do better? Because as you start to put cycles into these these sprints, right? You yeah. have you have one sprint after another, right? You can kind of get a sense of you know how many stories you're able to complete, right? How, how much work you're really able to to get through. And once you have that, you got to ask yourself, all right, why am I not getting more, right? And, and it could just be a personnel problem, right? It could be. I literally, this is literally the amount of work that these people can do. But typically what you're going to find is there's going to be a bottleneck somewhere, like in any kind of work situation. And any kind of management of the team, their job is to remove that bottleneck. Now, that's especially true if the bottleneck is external, right? That's going to be if uh, there's an approval process that is holding people up. If they're, you know, what, whatever part in the process is a bottleneck that needs to get removed until it is no longer the bottleneck and something else is the bottleneck. And then that can be focused on, right? So, so I think, uh, that's very important to, to hold a, a retrospective as, as one of the rituals, right? Not only to say, how did our work get done, but how can we improve the process that our work goes through, right? Uh, and that's very important to, that's why it's very important to list out the stages that your work goes through. So you can say, 
we're actually bottlenecking at this stage of, of the process, right? And and it could be the customer verification stage, right? Or it could be the uh, task, you know, estimation stage, like w- whatever it is, there's going to be some bottleneck there and, and you can continue bashing your head against it or you can sit down in retro and be honest with yourself and say, all right, I think we're having a problem here. How can we fix this? Uh, so that's important. Um, I think the other thing that's interesting is when we're talking about just planning enough to keep our team busy, we're talking about a time box. Um, Now, this is different from Kanban in the sense that a time box is not subject to pull signals, right? It's subject to, it, it's actually like one big pull system in itself, right? You, you It's a push system, really. You, you push work in for a given time, and then the event is the time is up yep. that you reevaluate, right? Instead of the event being, I have no more work, let me see what else is next on the stack, right? Um, so that, there's one big difference between Scrum and, and Kanban is Scrum is saying, we need to evaluate how much work it's going to take to keep our team busy. And we're going to evaluate that based on what just got right, output. Right. Right. So we're, we're going to say, we're going to say, this is what we think uh, we can do in a given amount of time. And we're going to plan to do it in this upcoming amount of time. Uh, so there's, there's a difference I want to explore going forward into the future. And I got to, Got a couple ideas for the next couple episodes. I might, I might toss one over to you that you might be interested in. Uh, but I think, I think that is it, Scrum in a nutshell. I mean, there's yeah. there's a lot to it, and a lot of it has to do with the the tooling around it as well. I mean, a lot of it will give you here's how to use this tool for Scrum, right. and here's how to use. Uh, this other add-on or this analysis or here's how you look at the data and right all all those are well and good but to get down to the philosophical underpinnings of it right there's nothing better than that book i I would say if you are interested in having someone come and look at processes or help you implement scrum we would both be happy to walk in and uh, kind of walk you through this process or how to get set up with it and even get set up with an instance at our compose. But other than that, I don't have anything else to add at this time. Yeah, no, I just, uh, you know, and, and, and talking about that, I mean, th- th- this is the reason we created our compose because right. there are so many right. tools out there. There's, there's an infinite uh, number of ways to implement agile processes like this, you know, and, and we don't necessarily follow scrum, but we wanted to take a look at it and see, Hey, you know what? This is our tool. This is a tool in our tool chest to use in the event that it fits. Right. 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 Um, you know, so so the reason we created our compose is to have these tools ready to go, uh, you know, to 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 further open source ideals because we we want to keep pushing that as well, and to to be able to to be productive in, in that same vein, right? We don't want to be held back because of open source. We want open source to jumpstart our productivity, right? Um, and and to, to share in that journey, go to rcompose.com, right? And and sign up at least for the mailing list where you're going to get a heads up uh, about these uh, these podcasts, you know, where we're, where we're streaming, um, where the recordings are released, uh, all the new videos that are coming out, you know, walking through all these tools and all these features and all these processes. Uh, but for today, uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.